the UK to what we call this ISAS uh, Ambassadors uh, Lecture Series. Uh, and a very warm welcome to all uh, others as well. Um, High Commissioner Philipson has been uh, representing the UK here since April this year. Uh, a vast experience in, in, in trade as well as uh, diplomacy. Uh, especially focus has been focused in recent years on, on Iran and uh, in more recent times uh, Libya. He was also a private secretary at number 10, a private secretary of, for foreign affairs uh, uh, to the Prime Minister at the Downing Street. And he will speak to us today on the FCO or the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the current objectives and uh, the place of the FCO in the foreign policy. Now, why would that be relevant to South Asia? Now, contemporary literature uh, on foreign policy uh, analysis tends to be process oriented with regard to developed states and function oriented with regard to others. I'll explain this in a moment. Uh, studies of processes uh, uh, focus on institutions and, uh, and the influence they exert on, on, on foreign policy outcomes, uh, which is why uh, say in, in foreign policy studies of, uh, on, on the U.S., we tend to look at, uh, uh, at the State Department, the FCO, of course, in, uh, in, in Britain, Quai d'Orsay in um, France, or the Aswati Kassamt in Germany. Uh, we also seek to understand how these institutions compete with one another. Uh, and in many of these sort of more developed, sophisticated systems. Uh, they also, as you can imagine, compete with other institutions for, for the ear of the, of the major policy makers, what uh, in, in, in the US, people like Graham, Allison, and I have called bureaucratic politics. In other words, uh, institutions competing with one another for, for the ear of the big man. Kissinger is called profit, but uh, it's really the main, main policy maker. So policy in many ways is the outcome of the interactions, <coughs> pulls and pushes of these institutions uh, with regard to the policy makers. On the other hand, in the case of developed countries, the argu developing countries, the argument has been advanced that their institutions are still rudimentary and do not merit the kind of attention that uh, and that institutions in more developed systems. Uh, uh, there, it's more interesting to study the outcome, the foreign policy itself, the function of the institutions. In other words, policy is a function of functions. <coughs> but today, today we are all aware that South Asia is rising. The institutions in South Asia are playing more and more important roles in, in policy making, in decision making, and certainly in, 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 in India, Pakistan, and to a certain extent, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka as well. Uh, uh, and some of these institutions, like foreign offices, are acquiring some of the characteristics of, of the developed partners. Now, uh, just uh, as uh, for the political system, the, the Westminster model has been the icon. Uh, uh, for, for foreign officers in these countries, uh, it has been uh, what is called the FCO in London, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, or, or the Foreign Office, or simply as the office, uh, the office <coughs> in the UK. Uh, interestingly, many of the forms that we follow in, in our offices is the same or similar to that of the of the uh, of the FCO, perhaps because of the past historical uh, or traditional linkages. Uh, of course, the Foreign Secretary in the UK is is a high uh, uh, state office; uh, it's a cabinet office. However, in South Asia, as you all know, we have retained the terminology, the the uh, uh, the title, uh, to describe the principal bureaucrat in the Foreign Office, the PUS, the Permanent Undersecretary, as in England and other countries. 
but in all South Asian countries, we now have foreign secretary. Uh, traditionally, it may have been because in India, uh, Nehru was the was the uh, uh, foreign um, uh, minister, uh, was the foreign minister's prime minister, and dispatches would not be addressed to the prime minister. Of course, no one would address Nehru. Uh, 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 dispatches. So there was still my dear foreign secretary, where it was addressed to the to the to the permanent <coughs> undersecretary. What in the FCO is called the cryptic telegram, uh, we call the cipher, uh, is is much the, in the same way. It's uh, uh, it, it's fashioned on on say uh, uh, the in introduction. There is a uh, then the details, summary details, and conclusion. So uh, there are similarities there. Interestingly, uh, many of our foreign officers have sought to place their private secretary in the prime minister's office, uh, not with great success in, 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 our, in our cases, but I'm pleased to see that in, in the UK uh, 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 this is uh, now acceptable. In all our countries, uh, the UK inclusive, foreign officers have to compete with, uh, with, with other ministries, other line officers, other line ministries. Uh, uh, and uh, tend to see themselves as not just one another uh, or another line office and st still uh, want to see themselves differently, whether they are able to or not. Uh, in the case of the UK, we will hear now. Uh, in, our, in our cases, we are, we are still striving. Uh, uh, so, so that is why today uh, an understanding of, of, uh, of an institution like the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in the UK is important to analysts of South Asian foreign policy and South Asian politics. Anthony, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. That is all. Um, well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and um, uh, thank you for that warm welcome. And uh, unless I'm wrong, thank you even for wearing House of Commons cufflinks. It's a very nice time. Um, yes. Yes. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> The, uh, <laughs> what I thought I would do, uh, I mean, when we were uh, agreeing the little uh, blurb or rubric um, for the invite today, um, I mean, I wanted to keep it deliberately sort of general, because I think that then means that we can range quite widely. Um, originally, I said uh, what that, uh, I was going to talk about what the FCO's objectives mean for Southeast Asia, until it was quite rightly pointed out to me that I was going to talk to the South Asian Institute, and if I want to talk about Southeast Asia, there's another institute I can go and talk to with a similar name. Um, so we changed it to the UK's foreign relations. Um, but what I thought I would do, uh, uh, rather than give a lecture, because uh, I personally am of the view that the British government uh, should do, and I say this privately and personally, I haven't necessarily described this to any of my ministers, uh, the British government should do less lecturing and engage in more dialogue. So what I thought I would do <laughs> is lecture less, set out some thoughts uh, covering as in part what, uh, what you've just covered in terms of the role of the Foreign Office within the decision-making system in the, in the UK and my perceptions on how that's changed over the last 10 years, um, during which time I've been privileged to, to sit in various bits of it. And then I thought I would talk about sort of uh, William Hague's objectives, the Foreign Office's objectives and what that means for Singapore. And then I, what I would really like to do is leave lots of time for you to ask questions because at least there's at least half a chance that we'll get to hear something that you want to hear about rather than just something that I want to talk about. So, where does the Foreign Office sit? I mean, you've, you've, you've given a, ve a very good overview of sort of the, the broad themes of the, the normal relationship between uh, the Foreign Office and, and other departments. I would, maybe just picking out of that a couple of thoughts. Um, when William Hague arrived in the Foreign Office last May, of course, as um, Foreign Minister within the uh, coalition government, the first peacetime coalition government we'd had in... Uh, in about 70 years, um, seen then as a bit of a dangerous experiment because, of course, we're very cautious when it comes to our politics in the UK. We like the first past the post system because it delivers stability, um, and people were very worried about the coalition. Um, I think it's fair to say now that, uh, for maybe at least two reasons, people are very comfortable with the idea of coalition. One, because it's not seemed to have uh, led to sort of dangerous paralysis as the Tories and the Lib Dems are arguing for each other <coughs> making decisions, they've been quite decisive. Um, and also because I think people feel that given the economic crisis that the UK is going through, which is severe, even if it's not as severe as some of our European colleagues going through, it's still very, very serious, um, we could not have had a government that would take the decisions or could have taken the decisions that we did take, uh, particularly on austerity and spending cuts, if there had been one single party in power. And that's rather oversimplistic maybe, but for me it's because uh, 
the opposition is now only one third of the parties. Whereas if the opposition had been two thirds of the parties, with the Lib Dems and the Labour Party attacking the Tories, I think that would have been that would have put them in a very difficult position. And um, the other thing I would just offer as a personal thought, uh, while I'm thinking about it, is that in large part the coalition is sustained from the very top down. It's the relationship between David Cameron and Nick Clegg that I think has made this work in the first place and is keeping it working now. And that's interesting because um, going back to where I started with William Hague who, uh, of course, is a politician of very long standing, probably the most experienced politician uh, in the British government, um, certainly in terms of having held office. Maybe people like Binks Cable would push him for, for a number of years in Parliament. But Haig was a Secretary of State in the, uh, the Major administration, was, of course, leader of the Conservative Party immediately after John Major, um, and came into the Foreign Office um, saying two things uh, very, very clearly. One, that he was going to put the Foreign Office back at the heart of international policy making, and I'll come back to them in a second. And secondly, that uh, he had no ambition other than to be Foreign Secretary. And the reason I think he was saying that is because traditionally, of course, if you get to sort of two, three, four on the list, the chances are you want to be number one. He, of course, had his shot at being number one back in 97, 98, and it, uh, between 97 and 2001, actually, and it didn't go particularly well. Um, and I think he just wanted to make clear that the only job he wanted to do was the Foreign Office. The only thing he wanted to do was put the Foreign Office back at the heart of government. Now, why did he feel that the Foreign, foreign Office wasn't at the heart of government? Um, I, of course, as a good, uh, loyal civil servant to the government of the day, uh, would not challenge his uh, assertion that the Foreign Office wasn't at the heart of government. Um, although I would just offer two thoughts. One, um, even when I was in number 10 uh, between 2004 and 2007 working for Tony Blair, who was very much a, uh, a foreign policy-oriented prime minister, um, I would uh, actually reject the notion that the Foreign Office was ignoring, uh, sorry, the Number 10 was ignoring the Foreign Office and was making all the decisions behind the door of Number 10. There is no doubt we had very influential people uh, behind that door, whether it was Tony Blair, whether it was Jonathan Powell, his chief of staff, <coughs> whether it was Nigel Scheinwald, who for the time I was there was the overseas policies advisor, policy advisor, whether it was Kim Darrock, who when I was there is the EU policy advisor, both of whom were double-hatted as heads of the government office secretariats, which are sort of important bureaucratic positions, but were also double-hatted as the prime minister's advisors sitting inside number 10. I sat underneath the two of them. I had people that worked for me doing Iraq, doing Afghanistan, doing development. There's no doubt we had quite a lot of resource sitting inside <coughs> number 10 that is no longer there, because when Gordon Brown arrived, he tore the whole structure up, went back to having just one private secretary. Uh, as part of a very, uh, I think it's fair to say, very visible uh, and powerful statement that it was going to change. We weren't going to have uh, foreign policy run from inside number 10. Which is fine, except for the fact that, as I said, I don't believe we ran foreign policy from inside number 10. I didn't do anything without talking to the Foreign Office. I couldn't do anything from within number 10 without getting the Foreign Office to do it. Um, I was in touch with the Foreign Office every minute of every hour of every day. I was also in touch with the MOD, DFID, Treasury, slightly more frosty, um, BIS, uh, DTI as was, Business Innovation Skills as is now, Education, every department in, foreign, in, in HMG that has an international network, which in this day and age is most of them. So, William Hague arrives and says, I'm going to move the Foreign Office back to the centre of uh, policy making. It's a nice rhetorical statement. What it actually means, I would say, is three things in particular. One, that uh, under David Cameron and William Hague, we have created a National Security Council that doesn't quite mirror the, uh, the American version, but is getting close to it, in terms of creating a bureaucratic structure that decides, policy, that decides international policy at the highest levels, is chaired by the Prime Minister or by the Foreign Secretary in his absence, and again, is, sort of, is, a, is a bureaucratic statement that we're going to do this collegiately, we're going to do this consensually, we're going to move away from sofa government, we're going to go back to cabinet government. Does that mean that every single decision is now made outside the den, inside number 10 on the sofa, and that every decision is made in the NSC? No, of course it isn't, because that's not actually how politics, I think, in any country works. But I think they're probably, it would be fair to say, is more of a, uh, a collegiate um, feel to, to international policy making in the UK now. Um, the other thing is that uh, to point out is that Hague and Cameron are very close. Um, Cameron, for the reason I said earlier, actually, is not threatened by William Hague. Uh, politically. Uh, William Hague has no aspiration to his office. The one interesting thing, and again, this is, I would make this as a personal observation, that I think is a bit of a challenge for, um, uh, for, or has been a challenge for William Hague that he has overcome, is that when he was in opposition with David Cameron, he was very much the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, or Deputy Prime Minister sort of in opposition. Um, 
George Osborne was probably the only other person who had as much influence on David Cameron as, as William Hague. Now that they're in coalition, um, David Cameron has a deputy prime minister, his name is Nick Clegg. Also, because William Hague is now the acting foreign secretary, um, there is a reason why lots of prime ministers in the past have put their sort of closest ally, biggest threat to their job, in the foreign office. It's because you spend half your life overseas, and the life, uh, the life that you don't spend overseas, you spend at home dealing with intractable foreign policy problems. You don't have a lot of time for domestic policy. So William Hague has gone from being sort of the very clear number two to David Cameron, to having a big job that takes his uh, attention uh, overseas, and there's now a real DPM. Now, that I think has been a bit of a challenge because that has sort of slightly weakened the sense that, uh, that the Foreign Office is the second office of state behind, uh, behind the Prime Minister's office. But I personally believe that William Hague has done a very good job of uh, putting the Foreign Office uh, back into domestic policy making as well as international policy making, creating the National Security Council and all the bureaucratic apparatus that goes with it. And I personally think that uh, international policy making is now made, whether you agree with the outputs and whether you agree with the policy itself, the way we make policy inside government is probably, I would agree, more coherent now than it was uh, under Tony Blair's time. Um, two final thoughts just on the process and then we'll get to some of the policy. Um, one thing that William Hague has been very keen to do is to make sure that there is much closer working between the Foreign Office, the Department for International Development and the MOD in particular. Um, and we now see a lot of joint working, we see a lot of joint visits by ministers, a lot of joint visits by permanent secretaries whether it's to places like Afghanistan or even to places like Brussels to go and talk to NATO, go and talk to the European uh, institutions, etc., etc. That is a relationship, a triangular relationship that I think is, is very important um, and has not always been as happy in recent years. And then the final uh, knitting up, um, and I'll say more about this in a second, is commercial diplomacy, um, which is a term I don't particularly like because it feels to me too transactional. Um, and what William Hague means by it is that the Foreign Office is the organisation in government that has the most extensive overseas network. Uh, what he means by it is that if the British government, if the British economy is going to get off its knees, it's going to come on the back of exports and come on, going to come on the back of increased uh, investment. <coughs> That's going to come from overseas, and therefore the Foreign Office, with its network, has to be much more plugged in to trade and economic objectives than it has been in the past and uh, it needs to work more closely with the business department, it needs to work more closely with UK Trade and Investment, who are our trade and investment promotion agency. Um, as I say, my concern about commercial diplomacy is the title rather than the intent. I think the intent is absolutely right. So, as I say, Hay turns up May 2010 and says, right, uh, we're going to put foreign office back at the heart of government, which is fine, but what does it actually mean? And what it means for William Haig is he's really sort of boiled the Foreign Office agenda, um, and then through, as I say, these structures at the heart of government, try to sort of force HMG's agenda, at least in its international aspects, into three pillars, um, and I'll just quickly run through them. Uh, in no particular order, uh, consular, security, and prosperity. Um, well, actually, I'll do it in that order for a reason. Consular, because it's the easiest one to sum up. I mean, uh, it, it's about protecting the interests of British nationals overseas. It's about making sure that we're there in an emergency. It's about being sort of a presence that, that Brits, wherever they are, can reach out to. Um, so that's, that's quite straightforward, except for uh, I would say that they've put a lot of effort into making the Foreign Office a more, uh, a quicker reacting organization to, to natural disaster, to conflict, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There is nothing that will finish a minister's career quicker than something bad happening overseas, and lots of Brits being trapped in it, and the Foreign Office being seen to be unresponsive. And I'm not saying that we'll never get it wrong again, but I think we've minimised the risk. Um, security, uh, because there is still a security agenda, despite all the focus on prosperity, which I'll come to in a minute, that doesn't mean that the Foreign Office has given up on working on things like the Middle East peace process. It doesn't mean that we've given up on working on things like counter-proliferation or counter-terrorism. It doesn't mean that we've given up on the security relationship through NATO uh, or with the US uh, or anywhere else. Uh, there's still a very heavy uh, security agenda. We're still very committed, of course, in Afghanistan. Um, we are still, uh, as I said, working very closely with DFID on, on development, which is at least in part for the Foreign Office security related because it's about preventing the causes of uh, security threats uh, before they happen. Um, and then, of course, working with DFID on things like stabilization issues after they happen. Climate change is also for us a security issue. And uh, a lot of people criticized Margaret Beckett when she first made climate change a big priority for the Foreign Office. <coughs> David Miliband maintained it, William Hague maintained it because they both see it in a security context. And then the third one, prosperity, which is probably the most important for me as I sit here in, uh, in Singapore, 
um, although having been here for seven months, actually even before I got here, and certainly having been here for seven months, I'm not willing to concede that the only thing that HMG cares about in this part of the world is prosperity, because I do think there's a security agenda as well, which I'll come to in a second. Now, prosperity for the UK is, is, is a two-step process. Um, the first year, I touched on earlier, was all about austerity, was all about fixing the deficit, trying to restore some credibility to uh, public finances that were uh, rather uh, the worst for wear. Um, and that's been a very tough process in the UK. I personally think uh, that it's about to get tougher because the second strand of this process was growth. And the gamble, uh, not the gamble, sorry, the plan that the government had for this was that the first year we would restore credibility to the finances and the second and third year we would start to put in place the conditions for growth. And in the fourth and the fifth year, which tend to be the key ones for any parliamentary democracy with a five-year parliamentary term, uh, we will start to see the benefits of that coming through in terms of job creation, the growth figures, etc., etc. Now, at the minute, uh, to be blunt, it's not quite working. And that's not necessarily because I think we've done the wrong thing, because I don't. I think we've actually done the right things. Unfortunately, the two key parts of the world in which we depend for our exports, which are the Eurozone and the US, have chosen just the moment that we need them to be picking up in terms of demand to uh, or rather go in the opposite direction. Um, so, uh, I think the government will stay the course. Um, I don't think there is any doubt about that. I just think it's going to be quite tough for the next two years in the UK. Um, and, uh, it, and we'll see. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the austerity cuts were backloaded because we thought that by the time we got to them, we would have sort of the surge, and at the minute it's not going to happen. But they'll stay the course. Um, and in terms of delivering that growth, since the Eurozone and the US are stalled at best, that means, of course, that there is one place that we're going to look to for growth, which is the same place that everyone else is going to look to for growth, which will be Asia. And it's not just China. It's India. It's Southeast Asia. It's South Asia. It's Australasia. Um, and what that means, I think, is, uh, well, some of it turns into rather, in my view, simplistic headlines, like it's about engagement with China or engagement with India. I personally think it's got to be more uh, subtle than that and more sophisticated. It's about the UK building a presence in parts of the world that are going to develop and going to grow. Uh, China and India, of course, are important, but uh, they're not the only ones. And at the minute, at least, the UK exports more to Southeast Asia than it does to China uh, and India, I think, actually, even combined. Um, now, what that means for the Foreign Office, just to go back a little bit processy for a second, is that William Haig has engineered what he calls a network shift, which is we're taking resources out of um, North America, we're taking resources out of Europe, and we're putting them into uh, Asia, we're putting them into Latin America. Um, the challenge for the Foreign Office, and this again is as ever with sort of these transitional problems, um, we can't give up on the old agenda. So as, uh, as you touched on in your introduction, um, before I came out here I spent two months working in the Libya political crisis team because the Arab Spring uh, erupted in uh, February this year. And it just shows that the Foreign Office can't forget about security. Um, there are still big security challenges, there's a big old agenda, which we're wrestling with how to deal with at the same time as we're dealing with a new agenda. Um, that's a, in a funny way, that's actually quite exciting being inside the Foreign Office because it means that you, uh, it's forcing the Foreign Office to think in different ways. Um, and there are sort of two things I'd touch on there. One is more flexible sort of people within the Foreign Office, more multi skilled <coughs> people. Uh, William Haig is absolutely explicit that he was horrified uh, to find when he got back into government that the Foreign Office had allowed uh, learning languages to slip down our list of priorities, had abolished the language school and things like that. It's going to take us time to rebuild those things. Um, so in, in the meantime, the Foreign Office is going to have to be agile and tough. Um, it also means that uh, the second point for me is that the Foreign Office is going to have to get more transparent. Because the Foreign Office, uh, I personally believe, um, and I didn't join the Foreign Office originally, I spent seven years in DTI and then some years overseas and then came back and joined uh, the Foreign Office via number 10, as, as I said. Um, in all of that time, I've been of the view that one thing the Foreign Office has not got right is its ability to plug into outside, uh, outside knowledge, outside expertise. I think the Foreign Office <coughs> in the past has been very good at understanding the countries it lives in, but frankly we don't have the resource anymore. We don't have the people. We can't pay to have people all around the world. Um, which means that we need to get better at talking to people, which as I said earlier is why I think we need more of a dialogue and less lecturing because we need to tap into organizations like yours, we need to tap into <coughs> society groups, NGOs, uh, other, uh, other governments, um, companies. Companies out in this part of the world spend huge amounts of money analyzing exactly the same thing that my colleagues across 
Asia look at, whether it's the South China Sea or whether it's what's happening in Burma or, or anything else for that matter. So we need to get more transparent. We need to be prepared to tell you what we're thinking because we need to know what you think you're seeing as well <coughs> because by definition there's more expertise outside the Foreign Office than there used to be. Um, now what does that mean for me sitting here in Singapore? I think it means um, being open, it means being transparent, it means being available. I think there's a particularly interesting thing for being, uh, being a British High Commissioner in Singapore and this is going to sound horribly oversimplified and you should challenge me on it. Um, but we do of course have a rather uh, sort of in some cases complex, but uh, certainly deep history in this part of the world. I think we need to spend more time understanding what that history means for our position going forward. Um, one thing I am very struck by in Singapore, I'm not surprised by it, because I, I, I'd anticipated it to agree. <coughs> Unlike other parts of the former empire, there's very little colonial baggage in this country. Uh, if anything, there's still a lingering sense from 1965 and 1971 that we left too quickly and too precipitately. Um, Singapore, I think, is one of the most open places I've ever been in terms of a government that wants to talk to people from all around the world. Um, and they want to talk to the UK, not only the UK, this is not a sort of an, an sort of exclusivity thing. Uh, they want to talk to anyone who has a global view, they want to talk to anyone who uh, aspires to sort of influence things that are happening across the world, and the UK still aspires to do that. Um, so the challenge, therefore, for me is how to set Singapore in the context of this new policy narrative in London. And in one sense that's quite straightforward because Singapore is certainly a, uh, a country focused on prosperity and economic development, so that's, that's, that's quite simple. Um, the challenge I have, to be really honest about this, is that London is very focused, uh, when it looks at Asia, of what it calls an emerging powers agenda. And my problem with that is that Singapore to me is not an emerging power. Um, it's not going to be a power in the same way that China is because it's, it's never going to be that big and I think they would be the first ones to, to uh, concede that. Um, and it's not emerging because, unless of course by emerging we mean disappearing over the horizon in front of us. Um, <laughs> and I, don't, and I don't think that's what they mean. Um, it's a mature economy, we have developed links, um, and it's the gateway to trade and investment in Southeast Asia and in some cases it's the gateway to trade and investment in China and India. And the other problem is that with some of the emerging powers, not all, but with some of the emerging powers, we're looking to build up a relationship from either a very low level or from a rather complicated level. And as I said just now, I don't think that's the case uh, in, in Singapore. We're not looking to engineer a step change in our engagement. We're looking to, uh, again, put it simplistically, to halt a gradual decline, I think, in sort of the UK's engagement in this part of the world and build it back up a bit. Um, so that is what basically I see as my, as my, my job description, my, my day job. Um, I did a piece of paper for London the other day and said that I thought we needed to focus on three things. We need to focus on our profile, um, back, as I say, to understanding sort of where we came from. What does it mean to be British here? There's a lot of Britain still here. There are three, uh, 700 companies, 32,000 expats, uh, the British Club, the British Association, the British Schools, the British Chamber. There's a lot here. And in a way, it's almost, there's, there's almost too much. We don't stand out. It's sort of almost part of the furniture. And that doesn't mean that I think we need to start sort of jumping up and down and shouting to the rooftops and saying, look at us. I think it just means that we have to think about how we put the pieces together. Um, and then, as I said earlier, I think we need to actually take this concept of commercial diplomacy and broaden it out a bit. I talk in terms instead of prosperity diplomacy, which is that the HMG should be using all of its overseas assets, of which the Foreign Office is still the major piece, to do whatever it can to support the prosperity agenda at home, to support British companies, to work with... Uh, to, to work on the international sort of regulatory agenda, to work with companies like Singapore and things like the G20. Um, I think we're quite like-minded and we need to do more about that. And as I said, we're not starting from scratch. I think we have quite a good position here, but the environment gets more competitive by the day. Um, no one, uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch anywhere anymore. Um, Singapore, I think, is prepared to work with us, but they're not going to wait for us to sort ourselves out. They'll work with whoever can suit their objectives, and I think that's absolutely right. So that's really what I spend my life um, thinking about here. Um, and I'd be interested actually as to what contact any of you have had with the British High Commission over the years. I sort of find people who fall into two categories, people who see a lot of us because generally they're in the business community, people who don't see very much of us um, and wish that they saw more of us, but until I reverse the decision and start issuing passports here again, they don't want to talk to me. Um, which I can't do. <laughs> um, and people who actually have never actually asked themselves why they might want to talk to the British High Commission. And it's actually that category of people that I'm most interested in. Because I think at the very least I'd like to make clear that I'm available for a conversation. So I'll stop there. Sorry, they've got me rambling.
Okay, I hope uh, we will accept your offer of a dialogue now. Uh, on then want to thank you on behalf of all of us for for a very stimulating uh, initiation of, 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 the, of the dialogue. The floor is open for questions, comments, remarks. Yeah, you, sir, and then John. Good afternoon, uh, Your Excellency. My name is Joseph. Allow me to ask you something that Hong Kong did a few days after the news report on October 9th, 2008, that Britain had frozen $7 billion of Iceland's assets with the Anti-Terrorism Act. Five days later, Hong Kong did something even more drastic and encompassing than what Iceland did. Hong Kong not only provided limitless, infinite, open-ended guarantee on all deposits in Hong Kong banks, Hong Kong even provided the limitless guarantee to deposits in foreign banks based in Hong Kong. Was Britain offended in any way by what Hong Kong did, especially because Britain only increased its limited guarantee from £25,000 to £50,000? Okay. I hope we have an answer for that. John, say hi. <laughs> 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 if, if, I, mean, I, I want to sort of go off on a totally different sort of tangent. So, so I wonder whether it might be better just... Well, it, okay. okay. Yeah. Let me let me tell you that. I mean, I have to say, I, I'm very happy to take your question under advisement, as they say. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, I was not in Hong Kong or Iceland or the Treasury or anything to do with that in 2008. I was dealing with the Iranians, which, uh, compared to your question, was probably quite straightforward. Um, <laughs> but let me. I mean, I, I would like to think not. I mean, I know that we offended a lot of people, uh, especially in Iceland, by what we did. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, back in 2008, which for the UK and many other countries was, was the depths of what we thought then was the financial crisis, is beginning to look like a bit of a kick. Um, we acted in order to uh, ensure that, uh, uh, that assets that we had, that we needed, um, were not removed. Um, and we're still arguing, as far as I'm aware, with Iceland. Uh, um, George Papandreou wasn't the only person to think about holding a referendum on a question that I knew he would only get one answer to. The Icelanders did the same thing in terms of the compensation to us. Um, I would like to think that we weren't offended by what Hong Kong did. I'd like to think that if what Hong Kong did was in order to make sure that there was no sort of mass run on their banks in terms of people getting their deposits out, well, that's what we were all doing at the time. But um, if you care to give me the detail of your question after this, I'm very happy to go and get you an expert answer. I'd love to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but there would have been, I would suspect, an OECD position on that, I mean, rather than a distinctive, very British position on this mm -hmm. issue. I know the, the, this, uh, this came up with the G20 and all that, and this is one of the reasons why uh, the whole concept of uh, uh, global governance group came up, you see, uh, 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 so that... Uh, uh, Hong Kong, because Hong Kong was withdrawn from the grey list or something. But uh, this, this was an issue I, I would assume that uh, Britain would have acted in concert with, with uh, some other countries. Anyway, John. Yes, as I said, I wanted to go off on a quite different tangent. And first of all, thank you for a very delightfully frank uh, sort of uh, little look behind some of the doors uh, around in, in, in Westminster. Uh, and a, a couple of quick points really in relation to looking behind the doors. Um, first off, I mean, isn't part of, uh, part of the current dynamics that, uh, that David Cameron is actually rather less involved, rather less prominently engaged in, uh, in foreign affairs than some of his uh, predecessors, particularly Tony Blair, which actually leaves the field rather sort of clearer for, for, for William Hague. It's a, it's a more sort of, in a way, a more stable kind of setup between the, between the, 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 the two guys at the top there. Secondly, and, and a different point again, um, you may raise the point about the importance of the foreign, the foreign office bringing in expertise from outside. But in what way is that is that to be done? I mean, I recall um, years ago when Robin Cook was uh, was foreign secretary, that he drew in to uh, as as advisors. A number of people, including those who might be working with in the Save the Children Fund, they brought in SCF's former Africa director as a principal advisor on you know, Britain's relations with Africa and so on. And I, I think that quite a lot of people in the Foreign Office were actually uh, you know, really quite, um, well, 
critical of, of this, this sort of a move. So I, I wonder what you think about the, you know, the, the best way, what the best ways are, really, uh, for the Foreign Office to draw on, on outside expertise. But then uh, two uh, questions, really, about, about British, uh, British positions. Um, one is uh, that you know, we in ISATS uh, are quite interested in, in China-India relations. And I wonder if you could say something about you know, what the British perception of the relationships between China and, uh, and India are. Um, and lastly, uh, another probably big question, but um, what about the special relationship? Um, the special relationship was uh, terribly much sort of uh, on display uh, in the days of, of Blair and Bush, in, you know, in spite of the celebrated or infamous Yo Blair uh, remark that George Bush was overheard as, as making to, to, to Tony Blair. But um, you know, the special relationship was very much sort of on display at that time. And many Brits, certainly, and of course I'm speaking as a Brit, um, were very unhappy uh, about that relationship at that time. I have a, the, the impression, as a Brit who hasn't sort of lived in Britain for five years, um, that the special relationship is uh, a great deal weaker uh, than, it, than it was. Uh, I wonder whether my perception is right or wrong. If my perception is right, um, would you agree that that might possibly be a good thing for, uh, for British foreign policy? Mm. Well, lots there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, let me, I mean, and if I'm racing through it, it's just going to give other people a chance to ask questions. Yeah. And maybe we're yeah. very happy to continue some of this afterwards. Um, in order, uh, Cameron, less involved, more state there. Yes and no. Um, I don't believe that any Prime Minister will ever be unengaged from the foreign policy agenda. Mm -hmm. Because Britain, for as long as it aspires to be a globally active power, um, is going to be, uh, the, the foreign policy agenda is going to be a big part of any Prime Minister's job. I think I probably would agree that he is less, um, t Tony Blair, I mean, he made a Chicago speech in 98, and that, I think, and then after that, of course, I mean, Iraq started to sort of, well, 9-11, of course, two, 2001, then we went into Afghanistan, then we went into Iraq. So, whether he chose to or not, foreign policy was always going to dominate his Prime Ministership. Uh, in ways, actually, that I think he would probably argue he, uh, he regrets. Because, of course, he's very open in his book and elsewhere that sort of the one sort of thing that he felt that he failed on uh, was public service reform, etc., etc. And he couldn't do that because he couldn't devote the attention. Uh, uh, and if I can, I mean, actually, I don't know, I should have checked at the beginning whether this was on the record. But I think the other problem he had on public service reform is that because he was weakened by what had happened on the foreign policy side, he wasn't able to take on the Chancellor and therefore couldn't do public service reform. And he regrets that. I mean, he's, he's been very open about that. So, Cameron is less involved in a way because the foreign policy agenda, in terms of the, the really dominating, overwhelming issues, are less challenging. But he was very involved in Libya. He was very involved uh, in uh, international economic issues through the G20, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think any Prime Minister can ever be uninvolved. I would argue, though, that one thing that Cameron uh, is, is just different under this government is that there is a foreign secretary who is uh, within his party and within the country I think is genuinely acknowledged as being a significant sort of influence in, in the government and with great respect to those who came after Robin Cook I don't think that's true of the Labour foreign ministers and I, I offer that as a is absolutely the person. I would not want that written down. But, I mean, I don't think you put Margaret Beckett and Jack Straw, maybe even David Miliband, in the same category as, as William Hague in terms of their relationship with the Prime Minister of the day. So I just, I just think it's different. Exp outside expertise, I mean, the bottom line is I think we've got to get over ourselves. Um, and maybe I feel this differently because I, I didn't sort of grow up within the Foreign Office. I think those who, people like Robin Cook and Jack Straw for that matter, brought in were genuine foreign policy experts who added a considerable amount to foreign policy making in a way that I personally believe if no special advisors were of that calibre, we wouldn't have the rather sort of uh, pure debate about the role of special advisors in government. I mean, there was a very good line actually in the FT today, which as I say I don't necessarily subscribe to in the whole, but if we had advisors who are experts instead of political trainees, 
then I don't think people would be concerned about special advisors. So I think there is, there is a role, there's got to be a role for expertise. Even beyond that, when I was doing the Iran job, I mean, I would talk endlessly, uh, <coughs> making clear it was all completely off the record, to people at IISS, to people at Chatham House, to people at Brucey, to journalists, to American academics, to the Israelis, to the French, the German. I mean, I would talk to anyone who had any sort of insight into what was going on in Iran, mm -hmm. because otherwise I don't see how we make policy. We don't understand the world. And as I say, the Foreign Office is getting smaller, so by definition, there is more expertise outside every day. If we don't tap into that, we've got a real problem. The flip side of that is that we have to be prepared to be open with those outside interlocutors about what we're thinking, because why should they be open with us if we're going to fall back on secrecy and classification so we can't tell them? Uh, China, India, I think this is one of the fascinating questions. And again, actually goes back to a reinforced point I just made. If we don't tap into what think tanks are looking at vis-a-vis -vis China and India, if we don't look at what companies are looking at vis-a-vis -vis China and India, if we don't find ways of tapping into what India thinks about China and India, if we can, China thinks about China and India, what Vietnam <coughs> thinks about China and India, what Burma thinks about China and India, then we can't hope to understand it. But we have to understand it because that's going to be one of the big dynamics uh, in this part of the world. We do look at it. Um, as I say, I, almost every now and then I wish that I was posted in China or in India because then I'd be legitimately able to go and look at the answer to the question. Um, but I think one thing we can do from here in Singapore is to look at questions like that because there are institutions here that ask the question, there are companies here that ask the question, and we have to get in there. Um, I think if I were to answer the question necessarily very simplistically, it's not a straightforward relationship. I don't believe that either China or India has any real interest in allowing the relationship to sort of to degrade. But it's interesting when you see both of them engaging with a partner like Vietnam, sometimes almost on the same day, um, there's clearly a consciousness in both countries about the rivalry between them. And it's going to play out one way and we have to keep the rest of it. Special relationship, um, I've always hated the term um, because it's, it's lazy. It suggests that we don't actually have to invest anything in the relationship. We just claim it's special and get on with it. I, I was in St. Petersburg uh, on the day of Yale Blair. Um, and uh, it was one of those moments where your gut sinks, you think, great, I'm going to spend the next two days dealing with crest lines to take. <laughs> I, the point for me is, actually, I, I just thought I couldn't understand what the fuss was about. I mean, Bush is a, is a particular character. It's just his personal style. It wasn't demeaning to Blair. Mm. The fact he said, yo, Blair, the fact he did it while he was lolling back in his seat, chewing on a bread roll, was not demeaning to Blair. It should have been your turn, you know? <laughs> <laughs> No, he calls everyone, he calls everyone okay. by their surname. Um, it was just, that's how he deals with it. If anything, it was a mark of respect. The fact he was completely comfortable with it. But it didn't look good. And uh, is it weaker now? I don't think it's weaker in the sense, uh, there's, the, the British government is still completely committed to its relationship with the US and still invests a lot in their relationship with the US and we would certainly not want to think that we are any less important to the US, but I don't think we think you just stick a label on it and stop working at it. Some hands hand screen up at the back. Yeah. <coughs> Professor Robert hey, Jeffrey. Um, as someone uh, you've worked in the Middle East a lot, you'll no doubt have worked a lot on energy. What's your reaction to the Australians apparently being on the brink of mm. selling uranium to India? Um, any kind of reaction? You could say none at all. That would be a perfectly valid reply. But uh, does it have implications, do you think, for uh, British policy in any way on the MPP and so on? Well, I get my, my, my gut reaction is that it would be a much uh, simpler world if the rules that were out there were abided to by everyone. But it's not a simple world. Um, I mean, once we got through the, the UK and the US doing the deal with India on sort of engaging in trade with them outside the MPP, I mean, so it's not simple, it's not straightforward. Um, I personally would have thought in today's economic climate, if Australia is sitting there on a valuable commodity, there is someone out there who wants to buy a lot of that valuable commodity, and the system is allowing other people to sell it to them, mm. why wouldn't you want it? I don't, I don't think it makes the world a more dangerous place. Mm. Um, I mean, uh, <coughs> say my, the one I worked closest on was Iran. Um, I can imagine that the Iranians will stick it into their narrative about double standards and all the rest of it. But that's quite a deep, rich narrative already. I don't think it can change anything fundamentally. Uh, uh, yes, Shanti, and then. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, emphasizing a bit on the special relationship and looking at how Afghanistan is evolving. Um, how do you see things beyond 2014 as the drawdown begins? 
and that links me to this uh, aspects you talked about in terms of security, prosperity, and the commercial diplomacy as well. What we see in Afghanistan is a lack of coordination between the three, between security, the prosperity, and the commercial aspects. Uh, DFID is doing a lot of work, but that doesn't seem to make much impact on the ground in the terms of stability. And therein you have a, a problem in terms of the long-term stabilization of Afghanistan. So my question is, one, is the special relationship between U.S. and U.K. As you, sh as you share and as things evolve, how are they going to shape your 2040? And the second is the coordination between the security and the prosperity component. And that links to the commercial, given that Afghanistan also has potential for a lot of commercial investment. Uh, do you want to ask questions separately, or do you think you can combine the responses? Uh, well, my a little more serious than that. Okay. <laughs> 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 I'm sure. Let's <laughs> approach my <laughs> So it must be about the film. I mean, let me, let me take your question in reverse. Um, my phone. Is that a problem? No, anyway. Um, and again, I mean, I, uh, I've never worked on Afghanistan sort of specifically, but I, let, me, let me try and at least answer the question in, 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 in reverse. There is no doubt that the link between prosperity and security is, is absolutely crucial. Um, and there's, there, it's not an either or, it's got to be both. And it's, the problem is that we've always tried to do one before the other. So you try and sort of sort out prosperity through alternative livelihoods and stopping people growing poppy, and then we think that'll make the country more secure. And then we stop doing that, so then you spend lots of money and lots of blood and lots of time trying to sort of silt security so that you can then get companies to come in on the back and create the jobs. And I think uh, my personal view would be that uh, both of those were never going to work because you've got to do both at the same time because they become, they either feed on each other or they destroy each other. What I think, uh, I, I don't know if there's a role here for the special relationship other than the fact that clearly there is a, a great deal of dialogue between the UK and the US and always has been uh, on Afghanistan, uh, not only with those two, I mean with the Dutch, with, uh, with, with, with the other sort of major contributors, the Canadians, the other major contributors um, in Afghanistan. Um, as we approach 2014, 2015, um, I mean, we of course, this is not, this may not look like it, but this is not us giving up on Afghanistan. It's us just feeling that something has to change. So we're still committed to Afghanistan. We will still be committed to doing what we can to help Afghanistan develop. There will still be a very significant sort of funding program to train Afghan police and security forces and the, and the army. Um, because if you don't have security, then no one's gonna go and invest in the country. And if, you don't, if they don't have anyone coming in to invest, then there's no future. So the two issues are going to remain just indivisibly linked. Um, you, can, you can certainly express views on whether this is the right policy in the same way that you can express views on whether we pursued the right policy over the last 10 years. Um, I'm not sure I'd want to give you my personal answer to that one. Um, it's, it's amazingly difficult. Uh, I mean, the, the third aspect, of course, of it is governance. Um, I'm not sure that you can actually answer the prosperity question, the security question, without the governance question. So that's also extremely difficult. I would actually state that for this issue, I don't think commercial diplomacy is a driver for British policy in Afghanistan in any shape or form. Um, you can say that about Iraq and oil companies, you can say it about Libya and oil companies. Uh, I, I would reject that we're doing this for anything to do with commercial diplomacy. Yeah, I recall reading somewhere that Afghanistan is one of the five pri strategic priorities. Is it not? I mean, well, it's a strategic yeah. priority for the UK because yeah. if it reverts or maybe continues uh, as, a, as a failed state or failing state, it remains a significant threat to the UK on the terrorism side. It's not a strategic priority in terms of commercial opportunity. Yeah, Mr. Jamal Boy. Thanks, thank you. Um, I'm dividing my uh, questionnaire into two sections. Well, one is, you mentioned Singapore. Well, Singapore is exactly in the situation that you are in, uh, in Singapore, promoting good relations with all its neighbors. Uh, and uh, as you know, it has its first started with its own solid finances, which we have kept and increased. And then, it has stretched out. In the early days, it stretched out to India when India was closed. Uh, we did a lot of effort to try and 
see where change could take place. And as soon as change took place, there have been a tremendous movements uh, between both the countries, ourselves and India. And the same thing was with China. So Singapore really has become a gateway for people. Uh, firstly, to put their money in because we're a safe economy. Their money is safe. Uh, and our banks are sound. Uh, that, that is Singapore's sense. The second part of the question is, is what worries me and worries a lot of people. And that's the <coughs> economic tsunami in Europe and Britain and its effect. Uh, Gordon Brown just recently said that the extent of the banking problem simmering in Europe continues to be largely denied. It is rarely mentioned that Germany's overly leveraged banks have liabilities 32 times their capital base. French banks 26 times. Comparable US figures is 10 times. Europe owes 40 trillion in liabilities, dwarfing any American, Chinese, or Japanese bank debts. Now, this will affect in a global world all of us. We are worried from that point of view because uh, Europe's share, it says, has sunk steadily from a peak of 40% to less than 20. In the next two decades, it will halve again as China, India, and others rise. According to Credit Suisse, Asia will account for as much as 40% of the world's consuming consumer spending, while Germany will have 4%, France and Britain, and Italy 3%. There is no sit and wait policy in an economic cycle that will fix this. Now, I don't know whether this, he has omitted members of the Commonwealth like Australasia and Canada, who are in a very sound economic position. But uh, there is no doubt, of course, that the growth is, the major growth will be here, uh, South America. Now, where does the UK, with its connections under the Commonwealth, and therefore India is one, one of the largest members in, in the Commonwealth, so that's that's a that's a plus point. Uh, where where would the what what's going to happen really to the UK? The wisest thing you've done is to keep the pound away from the euro, so you don't have that. Uh, uh, that problem. But how do you see the U U UK economy coming out of this? Well, as I said earlier, I mean, I, I don't disagree with any of the analysis that you just offered. Um, and as I said earlier, it's going to be a very, very tough um, few years. It's uh, We are not immune uh, any more than anyone else is to what is happening in the Eurozone and so I would still refer to the US as well. Um, because I don't think there are economic troubles at the moment. I mean, I'm not an economist, but the way I sort of tend to see it is that the, the U.S. has a, a big problem in terms of a, a mushrooming deficit, but they're okay because they can just keep passing legislation and keep lifting the cap and printing the money, and away we go. Um, you, the EU can't do that. Um, it can't print the money, and it can't just sort of ignore the deficits. So uh, I think uh, I, mean, I think what is happening in the eurozone, and again not necessarily, maybe some of the economically correct terminology. Um, I mean, it's deeply worrying. I mean, Italy is, is not gone, but is still in a very, very precarious situation. Today, we start to see the bond yields in uh, Belgium, Netherlands. Previously, sort of, when people talk simplistically, they would talk about sort of the profligates and the, and the savers. The Netherlands was in the second category. Now even their bonds are under attack. So uh, this is this is uh, endemic. Um, I think uh, you're absolutely right that uh, even those who people see as the answer to all this, like Germany, have got fundamental problems uh, to resolve. 
I think the UK has a different set of issues to resolve, <coughs> but it has to do it in the context of an overall economic situation that is not doing us any favours at all. Um, the answer, as I said earlier, for the UK is, is quite simple. Um, we are going to have to uh, rebalance our economy. We, 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 I think we've done quite a lot of restoring sort of credibility to the finances, but as I say, some of the effects of this have, have yet to hit us, and they get worse as we get into the, uh, the four-year um, spending periods. Um, we are going to have to do it by boosting our exports and continuing to attract investment in order to create jobs. Now, the one thing that is encouraging is that, uh, or, and it goes back to your point about the pound, the fact that the pound is devalued against most major currencies over the last two years has certainly helped the exports, so that's a good thing. Um, investment, we have retained or maintained the level of investment. It's not fallen away in the last year, including 80% of the investment that comes from uh, Singapore and Southeast Asia goes to, uh, that goes to Europe, sorry, goes to the UK. Um, I think we are still able, it's not easy, but we are still able to tell a story about the UK economy that is attractive to overseas investors, including from this part of the world. We are still able, indeed, we have to tell a story about the UK economy that distinguishes it from the Eurozone. Now, uh, actually, well, I shouldn't say this next bit because it's a, probably about another 10 minute discussion. There's a whole set of issues that come out of what is happening in the Eurozone and the solution to the Eurozone that are deeply challenging to a British government that is not in the Eurozone and is very, very worried that decisions taken to increase the fiscal consolidation of the Eurozone and maybe even the political consolidation of the Eurozone, what do those decisions mean for the UK in the context of the single market and the future of Europe? And maybe, as I say, that's probably a separate lecture. The role of the Commonwealth, um, I'm going to say something slightly um, heretical uh, on this. Um, I actually don't think it's the Commonwealth we should be focusing on, but I do think it's, as I touched on earlier, we should be making a very, very stark, hard-eyed assessment of where we have key relationships with key trading partners, be it India, be it uh, uh, Singapore, um, still the US, and uh, Canada, Australia, and we should be finding out how we use those for all they're worth, and especially for Singapore, not just because it's my responsibility, especially Singapore, given the fact that it is the gateway to Southeast Asia and into other countries where we don't have those traditional ties. We're working hard to build them up. Indonesia, Vietnam, heal the ties with Malaysia. Uh, but Singapore, we have, the way I talk to people about it is that we have an entree, we can get in here. What we do when we get here is up to us. That's where we have to work hard. And then we can spread out to Southeast Asia, we can spread out to India, we can spread out to China. It's gonna be absolutely crucial, but I wouldn't necessarily put it myself in Commonwealth terms. Mainly because I don't actually want people to think that in any way it's something, it goes back to the special relationship really. It's something that I think makes us feel a bit lazy. The Commonwealth, oh, we're just going to use that. No, we have to actually work at the relationships. Now, the Commonwealth history, in some cases, not all, helps us build those relationships, but it doesn't give us anything. Okay, now we have four more questions. Uh, we have to come to a close now, uh, uh, but we will take all four in pairs of two. Dr. Rajeshree Jetli and uh, Dr. Sindhapal Singh, first pair. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to um, get a sense of how you see the situation in Pakistan today and uh, how the UK proposed to engage with Pakistan. And I say this because some time back, we did a bit of a diplomatic hiccup with Cameron actually saying that Pakistan is looking both ways. Um, so how, do you, how are you now sort of dealing with Pakistan? I'm sure you have some concerns. Okay, and then send the ball. Uh, two little questions. The first one, I mean, I think it's in the news. Uh, within the Conservative Party, there's a huge debate about your relationship with Europe. I mean, this is a historical debate, obviously. Just your sense about, you know, talking about a referendum is going to happen. What kind of relationship are you going to have with Europe? And related to that is something which you say at the start. What does it mean to be British? And I, someone who represents your country abroad, I find your task a bit difficult because internally, for example, you've got people like the EDF, then you have calls for Sharia law in the UK, and you've got looting in London, uh, I mean, what does it mean to be British when you, if someone asks you for uh, what, you know, a three-minute definition of something? Thanks. <laughs> Two minutes. Two. <laughs> um, okay. Pakistan. 
Um, I mean, the, I, there is no doubt that this is a uh, that the British government sees the relationship with Pakistan and having a relationship and a strategic relationship with Pakistan as being of absolute crucial importance. Um, the threat of terrorism uh, to Pakistan is real, and the threat of pa the threat, the threat of terrorism to Pakistan and from Pakistan in the UK is real. So there's a shared imperative there. And I don't think that David Cameron, and I, I, mean, I remember the, the time when he made the comment, I think he was in Turkey at the time. Um, I don't think he meant by that to say that uh, we were any less committed to working with Pakistan to address the shared threat. Um, and I think that is what we should focus on now. I mean, again, this is going to be necessarily simplistic. I, know I, don't, I don't deal with it day in, day out. But we need to focus on the fact that I think both we and the Pakistani government would recognize that more needs to be done and more has to be done. And I think we've been very open uh, that we are absolutely committed to working side by side with Pakistan, mainly, I would actually <laughs> argue, in, in ways that are not visible. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes and it has to go on behind the scenes. Um, there is also a lot that goes on through the development programs, there's a lot that goes on through sort of de-radicalization programs. Um, this again is where I think there's more scope for sort of the British government, the Pakistani government working with civil society groups, with NGOs, and people who don't sort of come into this debate with, with baggage in the way that probably HMG does. Um, but there's, I don't think there's any way of avoiding the fact that it's, it's deeply, deeply difficult. Um, and, uh, but we're, we're committed to it. Um, and I think the, the British government will always be committed to it. Um, the EU, um, it's probably more complicated than our relationship with Pakistan. Um, the, the, the Conservative government, as you say, I mean, the, the splits on Europe are very well known. Um, I personally believe that a referendum on should Britain leave the EU would be a disaster. Because I don't see how anyone would ever get any answer other than yes. Um, I just, to me, it's the same as Papandreou saying, should we vote on yeah. cutting pensions and forcing people to work beyond 50, or the Icelanders saying, should we vote on giving lots of money to the Brits and the Dutch? You're not going to get any answer other than the patently obvious one. That's not to say I don't believe in democracy, I don't believe in referendum, I just think I have the time and the place. Um, the Conservative government, this is why speeches from David Cameron, including the one a couple of days ago, are having to straddle the two lines, that we are committed to the Eurozone doing what is necessary, we're committed to seeing more fiscal consolidation, but you cannot do it in a way that means that Britain's uh, legitimate interests in the future financial regulation of the 27 and the future regulation of the single market uh, is undermined. And that is the responsibility of the European institutions, the Council, the Parliament, and the, and the Commission. But it's, it's a tightrope. And there are lots of people in the UK, not just within the Tory party, and you mentioned some of them, um, who would love to see uh, him fall off this tightrope um, because that would suit their rather uh, narrow one-dimensional agenda, whether it's those from the English Defence League or those from campaigning for Sharia law. Um, I personally, uh, the, the, the riots in, in the UK, um, I, I just thought that was um, opportunistic. Something kicked it off. The, lots of people went out, including lots of people who actually had no reason to go and riot, just somehow bizarrely got caught up in it. I mean, including some educated, rich people who suddenly found themselves sort of with a boot full of stolen goods and then found themselves in front of a judge. Um, which is not, I mean, there's the, I think it's more complex than just a function of economic instability. Um, and that's not to say we shouldn't understand what it was. Um, and I think the government is, uh, is doing quite a lot to try and understand what that was. Um, but I don't think it's purely just a function of economic dislocation. Um, what does it mean to be British? Um, I think, where I would start with on this question um, is I don't think it can only mean looking back at what we were. And that is my, uh, my driving sort of mentality on this, is that if we don't find a way of defining what it means to be British that is forward-looking rather than backward-looking, then we're in real trouble. So, as I said earlier, what it means to be British in Singapore is understanding how it is that we got to where we are, and what are the elements of being British in Singapore, and then putting them together in a way that actually serves the government's objectives and serves our national objectives going forwards. I don't have a pat definition for it, but it would include, I think, diversity, 
an innovative economy, which I do think we have, it would include tolerance, it would include uh, a global outlook. Um, I wish it would include confidence. I think we do ourselves down. Again, not to say that we do not have huge problems, but beating ourselves up every day, whether through the media or any other means, I don't particularly find uh, all that constructive. But I clearly need to work on that answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the final two questions, Dr. Manoir and you no, sir. Oh, okay, quick one. Okay. Uh, oh, you quick okay. one. You try and do it in three seconds. Your Excellency, okay, just a quick one. Um, do you see there have been any cases where Britain has combined its e foreign policy with the EU, especially in the areas of the Middle East? Like you have, you talk about the quartet. It's the US, the EU, uh, Russia, and the UN. Uh, Britain has by far and away the most effective military in the EU. Um, it's tried to, it, it was a lead partner in the, in the Libya case. Do you see cases where Britain will try not to act, especially in areas of, in the Middle East, not act as part of the EU, but as a bridge between uh, the US and the rest of the world's position on areas in the Middle East, where I would say that Britain has special advantages as a former colon, colonizer in much of the Arab world? So let me okay, right here. Yeah. I want to check on your area of expertise that is Iran. I mean, what do you think is going to be the British policy, especially in context of the current comments that the Iran is uh, going to be attacked next, on, on one hand, and on the other hand, the international community is concerned uh, on that. Uh, your questions, more or less, on the same lines. No, no, no. But you, you'd like to take it anyway. Uh, right. My name is Sanjay. I'm one of the 32,000 Brits living in Singapore. Uh, but I've been away from the UK for a number of years now. I've been working in development for about five and a half years uh, in South Asia. Uh, so my question is very much development oriented. Uh, the Conservative government has placed a great deal of emphasis on development, especially development in South Asia. Uh, how do you see the role of the FCO in driving the development agenda along with DFID? DFID has a large representation in India and Bangladesh and all South Asian countries. Uh, how do you see Britain's role in development and how do you see the FCO's role in development in the next um, foreseeable future? Um, actually, I want to take that one last because then I can end on a positive note. Um, the, uh, I mean, the Europe and foreign policy, as you say, there is, there is now, and we've, we've signed up to this, we're, we're in agreement with this, there is something called the European External Action Service that um, other people loosely call sort of Europe's diplomatic <coughs> core, uh, which drives conservatism out. Um, the fact is that for a long time now we've coordinated foreign policy uh, through institutions in Brussels. And we now do so through the European Council and specifically through uh, what used to be the High Rep for Common Foreign Security Policy and is now um, essentially a sort of EU Foreign Minister type, currently a lady called Baroness Ashton, who just happens to be British, but that's, in a way that should be immaterial. It doesn't matter what nationality that person is. So there is a European foreign policy presence um, around the world, including here in Singapore, where there's a very nice uh, chap called Mark Ungerhoyer, who is the head of the EU delegation. Um, and he gets very annoyed because in state occasions he's always put last after all the ambassadors because he's not a proper ambassador, he's just a head of a delegation. And we tease him for that. But he's a significant player. Um, now, as you say, the EU also has for a long time sort of caucused as one within things like the Quartet. Um, uh, but it does not have a seat, for example, at the UN. Uh, it does not have a seat on the UN Security Council or even, or let alone, in, sorry, it does not have a seat in the UN General Assembly, let alone in the Security Council. And the UK would still uh, insist on the fact that foreign policy is a matter of national competence and we have the right to represent ourselves, even in areas where the EEAS is playing a role. So, for example, earlier this week, the European delegation goes along to uh, the NFA here to uh, carry out a day march on climate change policy ahead of the Durban meeting, and the UK government goes with them, along with the German government, the Swedish government, etc. So we still have national roles. Um, and I, that's quite complicated, um, especially going back to the early question in the context of a European, uh, of a Conservative Party that is deeply split on this issue. Most of them think that the European External Action Service should never be invented, should be abolished, and we should just do this bilaterally. I think, though, that David Cameron and Conservative moderates, and certainly uh, governments of the past, would argue that we are greater than the sum of our parts if we act together. The question is whether we can do it in a cohesive way. 
Um, I'm not sure that the French would agree with your assessment that we're the most significant military power in the EU, uh, and I would uh, concede that the Libya campaign was very much a joint UK-French effort, which actually is itself the culmination of about 10 years' worth of dialogue kicked off by Tony Blair and Chirac uh, in the 2K in 2004, I think, um, which has been a big push to try and have more sort of UK-French cooperation because we see ourselves as the most significant military powers in Europe, not only because we're the biggest, but because we actually have an inclination to go out there and use it, unlike some of our European colleagues. Um, <laughs> and so uh, we want to work with the French, not least because we want to stop the French pursuing their sort of historic uh, ambition of creating a proper EU military structure to rival NATO. A, because we believe in NATO, and secondly, because we don't think anyone has the resources to do NATO and an EU structure. And the French objective is not to boost NATO, it's to do NATO down. So, um, it's complicated, uh, but nowhere near as complicated as the second bit of your question, as to whether the UK has any advantage in the Middle East as the former colonial power. Um, I personally think that the UK should have uh, more to offer in the, U in the Middle East, not because we're the former colonial power, but because I think we actually know the Middle East, uh, or should know the Middle East, better than others, partly because of the colonial power, but we need to downplay that, but also because I think we should have invested more in that part of the world, built relationships, not least through our royal family, their royal families, uh, which is quite unique to that part of the world. Um, and goes back to what I said earlier, that the Foreign Office is only going to be effective if it, if it understands the world that we live in and can understand how to work with people, but on an equal basis, not on a colonial to colony basis. Um, and in no place is that more important uh, that we don't look like a former colonial power than Iran. Because a big part of the Iranian narrative is that uh, we just want to go back to being the colonial power. Indeed, it's one of the few parts of the world where we can give ourselves a little pat on the back because they think we're more important than the Americans. Because they see the Americans as the great Satan, they see us as the, l the little Satan, and then they <laughs> give us the, uh, the honorific of calling us the wily fox because they think that we are the brains behind American brawn, etc., etc. Having said that, actually, I don't believe that most Iranians believe that for a minute. Um, because I don't actually believe that outside the ruling elites in Iran, uh, the majority of Iranians want things to be the way they are at the minute. And that, for me, is the great tragedy, not only of the three years that I did the job, but probably the last 30 years, is that Iran is pursuing policies at great harm to its people. I would freely concede that the West, and in this I mean the UK, and I mean the US and others, uh, have not done enough or well enough at key times to frame the debate with Iran that exposes Iran's position for being what it is, which is built on a, a load of, sort of falsities. Um, and I personally don't believe that military attack will solve anything, um, because it's too late. Um, I don't believe that Iran wants to build a bomb uh, in order to destroy Israel. I don't believe that Iran wants to build a bomb uh, in order to dominate the Middle East. Actually, I'm not sure that most people in the Iranian ruling elites know why they want to do what they're doing. They just find it too difficult to change course. It's too much of a challenge for them. They, you think the Tory party is divided, go and try the ruling elites in Tehran. Um, and that's why it's so difficult, because you can't take that sort of morass of issues and boil it down into, um, uh, into a straight yes or no. We just have to keep trying. The European Union and through Cathy Ashton the Americans somehow, if they can bring themselves to do it, need to keep finding a way of reaching out privately, ideally, rather than publicly, and trying to see if we can't sort of stop this before the whole thing falls off a cliff. Finally, FCO and DFID, um, I think that one of the things that has worked better under this government, um, not necessarily because it worked badly under the previous government, is the relationship between the FCO and DFID. Um, I think the Secretaries of State get on very well, they talk to each other a lot, um, there isn't, it's not a sort of a challenging context in the way that it has been under some previous Secretaries of State in both departments, not all. Um, the bottom line is that DFID has the money, and the Foreign Office, I still believe, needs to uh, understand what it can add to DFID's mission through its political relationships, through its understanding of the countries that they're working in. Um, but it's got to be a partnership, and I think it is a partnership, especially in places like South Asia where actually the, foreign, the DFID is bigger, not only in terms of money, but in some cases in terms of personnel. Um, which means that although we talk a lot about sort of common platforms and, and things like that, in most places that will be based around a, a foreign office platform, I think the foreign office needs to be open to the idea of in some countries that being based around a DFID platform. But the bottom line is they're both pursuing the same objective, <coughs> which is 
the security and the national interest of the UK. So you don't see DFID being pulled out of uh, pulled out of India anytime soon. I mean, it, it, um, it has been it yeah. has been raised. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, or at least I let me put it this way: this is not meant to sound like a facile answer. If we do it, I hope we do it uh, because we've concluded that DFID can no longer make any contribution to India. Um, and I think that's something else. Yeah, it's a very strange relationship, though, is it not? I mean, India uh, doesn't claim to be a major recipient country, but DFID has the largest program in